Hello and welcome to another episode of Attacking Third, a CBS Sports Soccer Podcast. I'm Sandra Herrera, lead NWSL writer for CBS Sports. Joined today, as always, by my colleague and co-host, Lisa Roman, broadcaster and analyst for CBS Sports. On today's segment, we have an NWSL midweek recap for you all and an NWSL weekend preview to get through. Before we take a deep dive on everything, a quick reminder to subscribe to us on YouTube for NWSL extended highlights, exclusive interviews, our live recaps, and so much more. YouTube.com slash attacking third subscribe. It helps us out big time. We're going to be going live on Thursdays at 10 a.m. Eastern on YouTube for the next few weeks to talk about midweek matches and weekend games. So be sure to hit subscribe so that you never miss out whenever we go live. I'm excited today. We got a little bit of a, you know, content update for everybody to start out with. Yes, I am very gearing out our schedule because the NWSL switches to midweek <laughs> matches here for the next few games. And then a quick turnaround for Friday. It's a lot of games back to back to back between Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and then the Wednesday slate. So we get to go live on Thursdays at 10 a.m. to talk about it all. But I'm excited because we had three matches last night. They were really good games yeah. all across the board. Really good games. No snoozers in any of them. And we get six more coming up this weekend um, because the fun never stops. No, it doesn't. No, it doesn't. The regular season is in full swing and it's hard to believe that it started on April 29th and we're already like mid-May in this one. So kind of wild. We're definitely a uh, kind of regular season, like heavy regular season uh, midweek matches. We had three games take place last night. Uh, North Carolina Courage versus Orlando Pride. Racing Louisville FC versus San Diego Wave. And Portland Thorns versus Washington Spirit. We're going to chat a little bit about these uh, midweek matches first. And then uh, later in the episode, we will be going through a preview of the games that are going to be taking place this weekend. But we got to wrap up this action, Lisa. Let's talk a little bit about North Carolina Courage versus Orlando Pride. I'm so excited to chat about this one. Orlando Pride officially undefeated in their yeah. last three matches, <laughs> picking up a 2-1 win over North Carolina Courage. Goals from LaRue and Clough. Uh, Lisa, I got to look. We got to start with, with the beginning here. We got to start with our preview of this match, quite frankly. Who did we pick in this match? Well, what, what did the picks uh, break down to between you and I? Uh, we, you had a draw in this one and I had North Carolina taking the win. So we Let's are both go. losers. Look, love <laughs> to come on here and talk about how big of losers we are in, in predicting this match. I, the visiting side, Orlando pride heading midweek into North Carolina, getting on the board early. And it's, it's just like a thing. It's just like a trend for this, for this Orlando pride side. The trend is that we're seeing, an early goal or two happened for this team over their last few games. And not only is it happening early for them, like in the opening 15 minutes, Sydney LaRue is often uh, in the mm -hmm. mix of this. I, I, I love it. Uh, it's we we're seeing this Orlando pride team uh, slowly get some pieces back. It started with Aaron McLeod returning back to net Sydney LaRue, who was uh, working through, uh, an injury of her own now getting back out on the pitch for this team. And we're seeing the immediate impact that uh, that type of player has for this team. Uh, just, just an exciting time. I mean, I know yeah. for us, Lisa, when we were previewing this team, our biggest burning question around them was we want to see them lean in to oh, their yeah. rebuild a bit, you know, and they, they have a mix of, of veterans on the team. They have a lot of new faces and they've got an entire new coaching staff. And now they find themselves on a three game undefeated streak. I, that puts it so perfectly because there was a lot of question marks about Orlando coming into this one and even uh, North Carolina, frankly, because they were coming off of a bye week as their game was postponed due to COVID protocol. Uh, some rules changed in the NWSL about the COVID protocol. You could add now COVID replacement players. But when we previewed this North Carolina Orlando, we weren't sure what players were going to be available. And then looking at the yeah. line, we also were aware that it's a quick turnaround for these sides. And when we got the starting lineups, Casey Murphy in goal for the very first time this year for North Carolina courage coming back from injury, there was uh, 
no Denise O'Sullivan in the starting lineup. And then for Orlando Pride, no Darian Jenkins, no Leah Pruitt, no Gunny Yonstadter in the starting lineup. So there was a bit of minute restriction and minute management for the player. Um, I was a little bit nervous about because we know how Orlando can start so quick and without having a player like Leah Pruitt who can press so high and be that outlet player and someone like Darian Jenkins who can balance out Sidney LaRue, that wasn't there, but they didn't need that. Michaela Clough, the rookie for Orlando, a huge game from her. We saw her grow throughout the 90 minutes in this match against North Carolina. And it was really impressive yeah. to watch her combination play with Sydney LaRue. They, they combined for both of the goals together. That's how it happened. The first one, it was a really well struck shot from Clough that's parried wide by Casey Murphy. And then LaRue was able to follow it up. And then the second goal uh, for Orlando, it's scored by Clough, but it's essentially like a dummy run by Sydney LaRouche. She draws the players near. She doesn't quite get a touch on it. And then Clough is able to follow it up and find the back of the net. But this was an exciting game. You could tell some, some heavy legs towards the end of this match. You could tell that Orlando had just played a match that – North Carolina um, has a lot of players that hadn't played a lot of minutes coming into this one. We got really good looks from Brianna Pinto, uh, Taylor Smith, Davinia as well. Brianna Pinto getting the lone goal for the courage in this match. But um, anything can happen in the NWSL. And this is just the start of all of the chaos of the regular season. Yeah, I'm with you. I loved seeing uh, Abby Kim inserted in this in lineup mm -hmm. for for Orlando Pride. Um, Villa Corta as well, getting some minutes with, with this team again. We we talked a lot about uh, you know maybe newer or perhaps unfamiliar faces uh, with this Orlando Pride team and and the impacts that they're going uh, to have, but. Being able to sort of see this, this pride team kind of go on put put together like a a string of matches like this, I think is is good. That's that's healthy for for any team. I think that is sort of finding themselves uh, in in a rebuild year, you know, or for framing it that way in terms of you know putting together pieces to build on um, to to kind of look at and circle and say, okay, here's here was a match where we did some good things. Here was a, a match where we didn't do some good things. How can we you know, iron things out and, and and get and sort of make sure that we continue this run that we mm -hmm. had during this time, you know, because it's a long it's a long season um, for for all teams. And uh, I'm happy to sort of see what we're seeing at the, at the beginning of this season for for a team like Orlando for the expansion sides, obviously, as, as well. Uh, it's been exciting. But, you know, we saw like you said, Lisa, we saw a little bit of maybe fading a little bit uh, tor towards the end of that match, you know, a late game goal of Brianna Pinto kind of snatching one back for North Carolina, making things, you know, a little bit uh, nerve wracking, maybe perhaps if you're on the uh, Orlando pride uh, side of things, but um, I'm just so impressed uh, by what we've been seeing uh, from LaRue. I mean, I think she's building off of what, quite frankly, she was already doing mm -hmm. for this team to, to begin with uh, was a standout player for them in, uh, in 2021. So knowing that she went out kind of early in this season, I think we both were a similar agreement. We're just like, well, that is going to suck yeah. <laughs> for, for Orlando Pride. Hopefully it's not too, too long. Uh, but uh, well, she she made her return. And, and, you know, within this game, I think when it gets down to sort of those real kind of those those dangerous moments of a game when you're kind of like trying to close out maybe those those final 15 minutes. And although they did concede, when you're looking at some of the numbers out of this match, I'm very impressed with the fact that, you know, they won the duels battle in, right. in one against the North Carolina Courage side that that's not necessarily easy to do. And we've chatted about that before. Like it, it, there's going to be moments from this pride team where perhaps – they kind of maybe rely on a little bit more physical play to try to get them through some games. But I think it, maybe they struck a little bit of that balance finally in this one. Yes, I think that's really good to point out about the duels battle. Um, also, Casey Murphy, we got our first looks at her after dealing with a bit of an injury throughout this year. She was listed as questionable even coming into this match and ends up getting the start. Um I I wasn't seeing the same Casey Murphy that we saw last year or that we saw in the offseason um, with the national team. And I know she's coming off of an injury, but she looked a little less mobile in the box. Um, okay. Great shot stopper, right? She can do that, but a little less mobile. So that's something also to keep an eye on. Is she not entirely back yet? But 
I don't know, they needed her to play. So it's yeah, just something I mean, to look well, at as we as we also preview North Carolina. Yeah. They've got another game. Well, we ch- we we chatted about like how you know the players were some of the players on North Carolina were dealing with some COVID protocol, and while Murphy isn't one of those uh she's been dealing with a knee issue but with somebody like caitlin Rowland, who has been in the starting keeper position for several weeks now you know maybe we have to wonder if maybe this was a game too early for a player like murphy and uh, i guess we'll see when we kind of maybe get into the preview portion of this but congrats to orlando pride on the three game undefeated streak speaking of streaks lisa san diego hit the road And they headed over to Louisville to face Racing Louisville FC and put their own win streak to the test. They were the only team in NWSL to have three consecutive wins to start off the regular season. And Racing Louisville said, enough of that. (laughs) And they defeated San Diego Wave 1-0 by way of a free kick goal by Savannah DeMello. Something in the water in Louisville, free kick set pieces uh, being executed by this team to start off their 2022. Uh, What do we have in the picks in this one, Lisa? I think if memory serves me correct, I think we both went San Diego in this one. We did go both San Diego. You also said there was going to be a penalty kick in this Uh, one, remember? And I I went high goals two to one, and I think we said something like one one nil in this match. But um, I think... It, this was really fun to watch because we talked about how great all of these games were and North Carolina or excuse me, San Diego coming in, they had had two back-to-back shutouts to start their regular season. And uh, that now for them to be shut out for the first time this year was very impressive to see from a team like racing Louisville, whose defense has been good but not great they've been broken down a lot throughout the challenge cup um by houston dash even which doesn't have the most prolific attack so the fact that katie lund and the back line for racing louisville could come in and be incredibly secure against a really dynamic san diego team again minute rotation for both sides you're seeing here i mean alex morgan didn't get the start she came in at 45 minutes though and making a bit of a difference as soon as she does that getting shots off and and getting a little bit more lethal in the attack but throughout this match it was really evenly played and i think Playing at home for Racing Louisville gave them the upper hand in this match and and playing against a team that they didn't know, right? They've never faced San Diego before in this expansion side. And because of that and and the nativity of Racing Louisville, that really played into their favor because they could just go out and impose their game on San Diego throughout this match. And the set piece, I mean, I think it's now known across the NWSL that you cannot foul Racing Louisville (laughs) within 25, 30 yards of their box because they've got Savannah DeMello, they've got CC Kaiser, they've got players that can yeah. whip Ekic, a ball. Yeah. On, I mean, at Ekic, they can whip a ball on a rope and get past the best goalkeepers in Kaylin Sheridan for San Diego. And this goal from Savannah DeMello was a beaut, was a beaut. Sheridan even got her fingers on yeah. it and it still went in. That means it was kicked so powerfully with so much texture that as it curled towards the, the upper 90, it still went in despite getting tapped this game was great and a great goal um a great shutout by katie lund as well and and no casey stoney this is aware just before uh match happened i think it was either tuesday afternoon or wednesday morning that head coach for san diego casey stoney uh was been put on covid protocol so did that change things Probably. I think Casey Stoney is a really good game day coach and she can adjust things on the fly throughout matches. And we see her talking to our players constantly from the sidelines and adjusting game calls. And in their last match for San Diego, after they had gotten a goal, she called over Kaylin Sheridan and, and they were just chatting instead of giving her a hug. She was telling her what to do, how to change positionally and defensively. So uh, that's a big loss for San Diego to not have Stoney there. Yeah, I mean, and it was just so last minute too. like maybe, Mm -hmm. you know, under the impression like, yes, like if you just maybe text or or retest or, you know, confirm or unconfirm. uh, But unfortunately, wasn't able to make the trip. But, you know, Rich Rich Gunny, part of this uh, Mm -hmm. coaching staff, um, I would imagine that leading up to this point, 
there's enough game plan in place, you yeah. know, to sort of follow or adhere to. And, you know, for in San Diego's defense, you know, I think it kind of leveled out, I think maybe towards the latter stage a little bit of, of the second half. You know, you're talking about two teams kind of even on shots, nine apiece. Uh, Louisville just sort of edging that with with shots on target, six to four. But I think maybe I would have, while I would have maybe liked to have seen another like little insurance goal perhaps from from racing global i think i with this game for me i want to you know praise the the defense a little bit because i think this is an area that we've talked about this team before in the past where we're just like gosh they've got a little bit of struggle there's there's something on that where they're not quite on the same page yet and i liked that this was a game where they were able to go ahead and maintain a very narrow scoreline. We absolutely have to highlight Emily Fox. She was outstanding in this game, especially in the closing minutes, to try to go ahead and shut out and preserve this very narrow lead. So I appreciated, uh, you know, some of the defensive shape there uh, in the end. Uh, Katie Lund, obviously, we praised already. Um, but I like I like this. I love these type of matches like this because these are the games I think that people point to when they're talking about. NWSL and the parity within this league and uh, sort of the high level of competition that exists here that you can have a team like racing sort of go up against a team that is on a hot streak right now and just completely combo break that just end it shut it down and now you have uh, San Diego kind of having to hit the reset button and uh, you know go back to the drawing board and kind of figure out the the rest of their next few weeks because they're still going to be on the road. Yes, exactly. And and with this loss, San Diego Wave, they remain at the top of the NWSL standings because they are coming off of those three wins that they had in their last three matches. So despite um, not taking home any points against Racing Louisville, they stay at number one with <laughs> nine points, which is pretty impressive. And their goal differential from that 4-0 win uh, with Alex Morgan notching all four goals a few weeks ago has helped them tremendously. And it's those small margins that all all come into play later in this season. Let's talk about this last match for the Wednesday slate of games. This was an exciting one. I think you and I, we said circle this one if there's only one game that you can watch during midweek action. And I don't think it disappointed at all. I know we had a good time watching this one. It was Portland Thorns FC versus Washington Spirit. A 1-1 scoreline to close this one out between the two sides. Listen. A long time since these teams have met in Providence Park. They were supposed to meet last year, but unfortunately, the game was ultimately canceled and then ultimately issued as a forfeit to Portland Thorns due to uh, COVID protocols. Uh, and it's been a long time since the Spirit have been able to oh, yeah. head on over to Providence Park and go head to head with the Thorns and get a result. So here it is, 1-1 one, one in this one. Lots of exciting stuff in this one. Lisa, I think we both had Thorns in this one as well. I had a draw. You had match. a draw. Ding, ding, ding. Oh, my God. Draw. Finally. <laughs> I know. I had a draw in this one. I, I knew it was going to be such a battle, and, yeah. and that's exactly what we got. Now, there was a goal that was called offside from yep. Emily Sonnet, so it could have been 2-1. It could have been a Washington Spirit win, but um, you mentioned such a long time for the Spirit to go to Providence Park and play in that facility, and also Washington uh ending Portland Thorns shutout streak. It was Bella Bigsby actually at the start of this game before the first goals had happened that she surpassed 80 franches shutout streak for the Thorns. And then Washington Spirit Ashley Hatch puts that to bed. This game was tremendous. The first half was hectic and chaotic and there was a lot of energy and it was moments of fast paced soccer, but also moments of feeling out the opponent and, and just settling the game down. And at halftime going into, um, the second 45 tied zero zero. I was still convinced that we were going to get goals. It was like, there's yeah. too much energy in this match and there's too many goal scorers in this game right now that it's going to end scoreless. Um, it, it does once one goal a piece, but the first one coming from Portland thorns from the home side and I wasn't surprised by this at all. Sophia Smith ends up netting the goal. She had a tremendous game for Portland Thorns. She was battling up against Emily Sonnet. That 1v1 battle was so fun. Oh, God. So impressive. Yeah. Emily Sonnet won it 
99% of the times. Actually, the goal that Smith scores, she's not going up against Sonnet. It was on the right side of the field. So it's Sam Staub that's trying to stop Sophia Smith and the angle that Smith scores this goal at from the far side of the 18 is just really, really impressive. Um, there were some tired legs throughout this game. You could see that a little bit from, from Washington Spirit as they've had such quick turnarounds, lots of travel coming into this one, dealing with lots of players and their injury and player rotations. We saw Anna Helferty back into her 2021 spot on the field in the outside back role for Chris Ward. I, I didn't like it. I Honestly, I did not like Anna Helferty in the back line. I like her higher up the field. Without Tara McKeown, they need someone else in the front line, and Ashley Sanchez needs to be in the midfield for Washington. I, I think that would have changed things against yeah. against this Portland Thorns side. A big part. I mean, I think a big part of it for me, and honestly for us, as we talked about it in the previewing of this game, uh, was you know the quick turnaround, I think, for a team like the Spirit. The fact that they have had such a compressed, uh, match-heavy kind of schedule to start out. their 2022. Uh, kind of have to maybe pick and choose your ba your battles as you're looking. Ahead. If you're the coaching staff and, and looking ahead of things and, and kind of playing around with the concept of, of minute management or player rotation, and you got to circle certain games and say, okay, maybe this player is going to get a 45 here or a 60 here, et cetera, et cetera. I think maybe that that's coming into play. And then you kind of mix that a little bit with the fact that there are a couple key players who are working through some things in, in Kelly O'Hara, Andy Sullivan, who have been unavailable for this team for, you know, the last couple of matches. I think that comes a, a lot to, you know, to, to, to play into those types of scenarios, but not super surprised that maybe some of the goals in this one weren't coming until the second half mm -hmm. for both of these teams. Cause it, the first half was just like setting up a very, I think, exciting kind of uh, blueprint for, for everybody on both sides of the pitch. And I think for, for those of us at home, uh, watching. So then I was like, when they went in a halftime scoreless, I was like, okay, I was like, we might, we might get some fireworks in, in the second half. And, and we did, but so I, I don't like, it's, you see this scoreline and, and maybe it's, if you're not watching the game in, in real time, you're kind of like looking at it and you're like, okay, like maybe not too much happened, but there was a lot of uh, good action in this one. Very, very into one, probably one of my favorite games of the regular season mm -hmm. so far for me, it kind of lived up to the billing in terms of, you know, spirit, not able to be in Providence Park in, in quite some time. These two teams going head to head for the first time in a while. It, it lived up to that for me. And I love that it was, of course, like who is it going to be for Portland Thorns, if not Sophia Smith? But I absolutely loved that it was a link up with Natalie Quica and Smith in this goal. I think uh, Quica has been huge for the Portland Thorns to start off this season. I would also maybe throw in, somebody like a Megan Klingenberg. I feel like these are two mm -hmm. players who cover so much ground and the two of them have had massive, massive performances for this Thorns side. But it was a short, it, it was quick. It was a short lived lead. And we had Ashley Hatch, you know, equalized yeah. just, just minutes later, quite frankly, in this one. So it was a little, um, it was not super surprising for me that they came in the second half. Um, and then that that offsides call, I think you, you kind of maybe people were like, oh, like, how is that going to, you know, not be off? But I think there was enough there for officials to to make the call. But I think what was probably more impressive after that was this end to end kind of awareness yeah. from the spirit. It was it was immediate. They saw it was offside. The call was not the goal was not given. Uh, and the immediate like presence of mind for this entire team to just completely sprint the other way and get on the defensive end to sort of lock things up. I thought was, uh, was kind of, was kind of funny and it, it made me chuck a little bit. I loved it. I was like, so look, look at the energy here. It was so impressive. And, and yeah, the entire team sprinting, but it was Ashley Sanchez and Trinity Rodman who are on the outskirts of the corner because that's typically where uh, forwards go defensively or uh, excuse me, on the attacking side of, of, corners you want your center backs in there who can get up head the ball be aggressive and on this quick counter attack that Washington now had to defend it was Ashley Sanchez and Trinity Rodman becoming center backs yeah. and, and tearing down the field to do that and that's like the work off the ball that so many times we talk about and it gets lost on a lot of people but you can see it specifically in that play because you just see Sanchez and Rodman sprinting down the field together yeah. looking to get back in position.
Yeah, for sure. I think we got to chat a little bit about Vafa before um, we head into the preview segment of this episode about maybe some things that came out post game. Ashley Hatch um, going down, and there was a collision there with with uh, Bella Bixby at, at one point. Uh, Chris on the Ward, goal. On, on the goal. goal. Chris, Chris Ward, um, you know, expressing his frustrations, uh, you know, as a head coach in the post game about uh, some of the things going on here. And this is this is something that we've been been hearing not only from Chris Ward, but Chris Ward specifically, but a number of other coaches in the league getting getting into post games and expressing their frustrations. And now it is we're we're watching this or we're hearing uh, this kind of shift a little bit in the, these arguments that are taking place within the the post games that are occurring here it's it's going from you know just general frustrations with the officiating Mm -hmm. whether it's of the opinion that officiating is is not making the appropriate calls or there's not you know enough clarity on the calls that are being made and it's shifting a little bit uh to what is quite frankly turning into a player safety issue for a lot of these coaches um and you have Chris Ward in in the post game, uh, speaking specifically about some of his players and and making very valid points, uh, you know, specifically about a player like Ashley Sanchez or Trinity Rodman or somebody like Emily Sonnet who sustained an early rib injury, uh, talking about that these are these are the players that people buy tickets to go and see, mm-hmm. specifically these type of players. And I don't think he's incorrect in that uh, assessment. So I think it's some underable, understandable frustration. I think that's mounting. And I think it's something that we're going to have to continue uh, to keep an eye on, quite frankly. Yes, I agree. He was very upset in his post-game press conference talking about that and, and player safety and um, really calling for a call to action from the league, from the referees about what he can do. And I think he warned the officials at halftime, like this game is getting out of hand. Like you, you guys yeah. need to control it. Someone's going to get hurt. Um, and uh, yeah. luckily Hatch was able to finish out the game, but both Bigsby and Hatch went down pretty hard. There's a number of tough injuries and, and tough yeah. calls in that match. I mean, it got feisty. It definitely got feisty. I think, you know, and I think the, uh, another point to this, I mean, if you're the head coach, you're going to, you're going to have the, the, you know, the biggest perception of your own team, right. And sort of have the clarity that it's, it's happening in front of you to your team and to your players. But, you know, I think the argument um, holds more weight if you're looking, if you're looking at this across the board, you know, mm-hmm. uh, there was a really bad moment when Sam Staub, you know, made a very poor choice and made a very bad tackle on Caroline. Yeah. And now this is a player who is out for several weeks. So it's it's across the board. So it's like there's moments that are happening to spirit players specifically. And there's there's a very clear moment that your example that you can look at from a spirit player making a very poor tackle on an on, on an opposition. So it's kind of like it's it's sort of something that we have to pay attention to across the board. Uh you know, when we're looking, I think maybe at all 12 teams and it's very, very early in the season. So it's something I think I know that we're going to pay attention to, to sort of see how this continues to mm-hmm. develop, but uh, Washington spirit and Portland Thorns splitting the points in this one, us both, uh, you know, curious about uh, what else is going to come out of this in terms of officiating or player safety. We'll keep an eye on it for everybody. That's it for the recap portion of this. We have picks to make for, for the upcoming matches this weekend. And we're going to do that for you all right after a quick break. Greetings, aviators. This is your captain speaking. Where the hell is he? What the hell? I'm right here. Maverick, the kind is headed for extinction. Smoke in the air! Smoke in the air! Maybe so, sir. But not today. Top Gun Maverick, rated PG-13. All right, let's chat about the upcoming slate of games that are going to be taking place this weekend. We've got a double header on Saturday and a quadruple header on Sunday. That is a massive amount of games. Let's go through the slate. Portland Thorns FC going to host Houston Dash Saturday. Kickoff at 6 p.m. Eastern. Angel City FC versus Kansas City Current. Saturday kickoff at 10.30 p.m. Eastern. And then for Sunday, North Carolina Curves versus San Diego. That starts at 2 p.m. Gotham FC versus Louisville. That starts at 5 p.m. Oil Rain versus Washington Spirit, that starts at 6 p.m. And Orlando Pride versus Chicago Red Stars, that kicks off at 7 p.m. 
So definitely going to have to uh, have multiple devices over the course oh, of this yeah. weekend for sure to take a look at everything. Let's start with this first slate of games, Lisa. Portland Thorns versus Houston Dash. Portland Thorns coming off that midweek match. Houston Dash getting a standard week. Who, who are you looking at in this one and why? So Houston doesn't have a midweek game. They did not play this last night, this past Wednesday. Um, because of that, they've had a little bit more rest. However, Portland Thorns, they, they got a goal over Washington Spirit. They have a lot of power. I mean, traditionally, I think I would say Portland. I would just give Portland the ha upper hand in this match and, and kind of go from there. However, Portland's dealt with a little bit of back-to-back -back play and and they are your this is a very quick turnaround from wednesday to saturday for this match portland number four in the standings houston number six in the standings um i'm still gonna give it to portland though i, I have portland in this match taking the win yeah. over houston dash uh this game is going to be played at home for portland at providence park so that gives them the upper hand as well yeah. and that's a tough place for houston to come in and, and play but um i'm hoping for some goals i'm yeah I That's feel you on like, that. Yeah, I feel you on that for sure. I, I think, you know, the there's an added benefit to even, even though it's kind of a quick turnaround. If you're Portland Thorns, you're not you're not on the road to travel, you know, for for this type of match. You, you get to, to stay at home. You get to go ahead and go through your normal processes that you would uh, ahead of a, of a match week. I'm sure the coaching staff and, and Wilkinson is, is are looking at things and maybe there's less training or, or more rest, you know, in between this. So when I'm looking at these two teams, we're also noticing a little bit of an early trend here, I think, to sort of kick off the season. There are teams that are coming off of heavy match load type of weeks and they're coming in and maybe looking a maybe more, more in form or they look like the team that is not missing the step to kind of start off their games. So I'm looking at a Portland Thorn side that's coming off a quick turnaround that's going to perhaps take it to a Houston Dash side that has had a little bit more time to kind of uh, prepare for some things. I just uh, I want to see in this game multiple goals. I'm just going to say it. Same. We haven't had a multi-goal game from Portland in a while. And I think they've got too much talent there to have these narrow score lines. I'm going with Portland, but I also want to say I want more goals. And I hope that they get them in this game. Uh, who are you going to be looking at in terms of like maybe an individual battle? Lisa, is there anyone in this one that you want to have kind of have a breakout game? Um, honestly, I want Morgan Weaver for Portland to, to get on the board because this is a player that has moments of greatness, but I want a full 90 if, if she plays however many minutes Weaver is on the pitch. I want her to be lethal in, in last night's match for Portland against Washington. Uh, she came on in the second half and, and she did produce and she was able to be a threat um, and be an influence in the attacking end. But for Morgan Weaver, I, I want more. I want her to lean on Sophia Smith, lean on Christine Sinclair, lean on those outside backs to whip balls in for Weaver and and for Morgan Weaver to find the back of the net. I'm with you on that. I like that. Let's uh, move ahead to this next match coming up. Make our picks. Angel City FC versus Kansas City Currents. Two teams that did not have a midweek match in this one. They're going to get a fresh look at each other. We're making a note of that, that some of the expansion sides are getting their first looks at teams that have already been a little bit more established. But I'm a little bit curious to how this game in particular is going to play out, Lisa, because it's a Kansas City side that only has a year of NWSL competition under their belt. So it's kind of like an expansion side versus, uh, you know, a freshman team versus maybe a sophomore team. And I don't mean that in any type of disrespectful way, but I'm very curious as to how this match is going to play out because it's the first time that these two teams are going to get um, a real look at each other uh, in regular season action. Uh, who are you picking in this one and why? Kansas City traveling to Los Angeles to take on Angel City in this match. Um, Kansas City coming off of a 2-2 draw to Orlando. A late game yeah. penalty kick is the one that essentially lost this for Kansas City or or went from winning it to tying this match against Orlando, um, which was sloppy. But we've seen really good pieces being put together by Kansas City in this regular season. Throughout the Challenge Cup, they won their central region. They can score goals. They have a number of rookies that have stepped up and just continuously gotten experience. However, Angel City 
playing at home. We know playing at Bank of California Stadium is a huge bonus for Angel City coming off of a win over reigning NWSL champions in the Washington spirit. Um, and frankly, they've got Kristen Press. <laughs> so that's something that is just huge for Angel City. Uh, this match being played in Los Angeles gives Angel City the upper hand. I honestly, I see this one as a draw. I do because I think Kansas City is going to come out and get goals, get on the board. They have a lot of power up front. They have a lot of mentality to be this team that can be a bit of a wrecking ball that can throw teams yeah. on their tail and give them a spin. But Angel City, they've had a lot of possession build up throughout this regular season that they can keep the ball. They can be a threat. Um, and they have – Kristen Press and Simone Charlie up top. We'll see where uh, Tyler Lucy slots in. We saw her in the back line before. Will she continue to be up top? June Endo has been a huge force for Angel City. Yeah. I see lots of goals, but ultimately a okay. tie in this match. I, I love that you want this one to be a shootout. Listen, I would love for this one to be a shootout as well because I'm not too sure um, if people would peg this one maybe as the one to be kind of the shootout game, but there's a lot of strong uh, attacking pieces mm -hmm. for for both sides of the of the ball and this one uh I, it's just i think it's just a matter of again who's going to be available what it's going to look like i even think for angel city on the defensive side of things that they have if they see the return of uh you know ali riley to the back line yeah. there, that can change things which uh, i think for, for this team I yeah, this was a player who was out uh, yeah. under a COVID protocol, and it's it's been a couple weeks here uh, that the that the club has sort of navigated things on the pitch, uh, you know, in her absence. But a huge piece to the, their back line, captaining uh, the pitch when when she is out there. So I think that'll maybe present some challenges for uh, an attack in Kansas City that I think we're still a little unsure of what it's going to look like. We've been seeing we've been high on, on on rookie Elise Bennett, but she has been listed as questionable. And we finally saw her get in last week's match uh, in the second half and immediately uh, have an impact. We're talking about a, a goal, an assist, uh, and this is a game that I'm sure Kansas City is looking at and going to say this is a game that we should have had all three points, but it did not work out that way. I think those are the type of games that can perhaps be a little bit of that motivating factor, the chip that you carry when you're looking for that little bit of uh, extra extra added oomph to sort of take into uh, an away game, quite frankly. Uh, so we'll, we'll see what happens in this one. When, I, when I'm looking at this one, Lisa, I, I think I'm, I'm leaning a little bit more towards Kansas city so i think you and i are both going to be going for the current in this one but when i'm looking at breakout performances i still have like players that i want to have strong games on both sides of the pitch if elise bennett is available and ready to go in this game i want to see a continued uh development yes. with her i'm sure she will be an added component to that attack uh, so hopefully she is available for the kansas city side to go ahead and choose for selection and when i'm looking at angel city i'm looking at simone charlie so i would love to see these two players on the pitch and have strong matches for both of their clubs but we're both going kansas city so we'll oh, see I'm how that draw. i'm going to draw oh really are you gonna go draw i'm I going to draw. Kansas City. okay well i'm going kansas city i want to yep. pick a winner in in this one i'm gonna i'm, I'm gonna, gonna go. shoot out and i'm gonna stick with the draw i, think I respect that's it i respect it all right well speaking of draws we'll get to this one right now uh let's talk to this next let's talk about this next match ol rain versus washington spirit i think i've tipped my literal hat a little bit of what i'm viewing this match to sort of roll out with uh we're gonna have a very early rematch between these two sides these two teams a lot of familiarity between them already they've played a challenge cup semifinal between each other they have played their first round of a regular season against each other and now we've already got their second and final regular season match between the two of them oh rain Finally going to get to host at Lumen Field in this one. Lisa, when you're looking at these two teams, who are you picking and why? This is so hard because Washington is, is coming off of a really tough match on Wednesday versus Portland. 1-1. One, one. And they look tired. There was a lot of player rotation in that. We heard some player injuries happening in, in uh, their midfield unit. We saw lots of different rotations with Anna Helferty being pulled to the back line. Um, Trini Rodman, she didn't look herself. She wasn't as aggressive in the attack as she usually has been. And she was a little bit more subdued in her presence on the pitch against Portland. 
I think the rivalry between Washington and O.L. Reign runs deep. And, and that makes the blood boil between both of these sides because of how everything has kind of unfolded uh, for these teams. So Washington, they're coming off of this tight draw against Portland 1-1. And O.L. Reign, they're coming off of a tight draw as well against Portland 0-0 in that match. And, and before that, O.L. Reign, they had lost to Washington Spirit. So the quick turnaround in playing these teams again, O.L. Reign, they have that bitter taste in their mouth after being on such a high, getting so much consistent play, winning a lot of games back to back, and then hitting this slump where Washington spirit put them on their heels and, and took the challenge cup from them and then a regular season win. However, Washington, they're coming off of a really quick turnaround. I give the upper hand to OL rain playing at home. I think OL rain is going to win this one with, with Rose Lavelle that they have okay. and the other powerful players uh, in the midfield. OL rain is going to win this battle against Washington, just based on what I've seen from Washington. Um, hopefully they drop Ashley Sanchez back in the midfield, yeah. Helferty up higher. That'll help things out for Washington. But, um, I have all rain taking the win in this one. You already tipped your hat, but <laughs> here, why you got to draw? <laughs> Listen, I, it, I, <laughs> well, we do this all the time. Lisa, we talk off my we we text each other, we chat a little bit about it, about how what we're what we're leaning towards or what we're feeling. And this is another one of those games where I kept going back and forth. I, I made arguments in my head for for the rain. I made arguments, uh, you know, in my head for for the spirit, how things were going to look. What I do know is that we're gonna get another competitive game. Oh yeah, one. because these two teams they have a rivalry. There's there's no ifs ands or buts uh, about it. This has been um, you know growing for for quite some time, and I love it. I'm here for I'm here for these types of organic rivalries that sort of just kind of grow naturally in in a league. And I think it's typical to sort of take a look at regional areas and just assume that there are going to be these rivals. But I love a great. West versus East rivalry. And I think that's what we're going to see in this one. I think we're going to get good scenes in Lumen Field, hopefully for this one. But I, I was going back and forth. And I think in this one, I'm still leaning towards the draw. I'm going to lean into that draw. I hate to do it. I love to pick a winner and I love to pick a loser. But there was just too many good arguments. I think on both these sides. I I, I just I'm a little curious of who in the minute management and the player yeah. rotation or what that's going to look like on the Washington spirit side of things. Are Andy Sullivan and Kelly O'Hara going to be available in this match? IDK like we are doing this ahead of an availability report. Uh, but these again are two players who have been uh, navigating through some injuries. Uh, and even if they are available, what does that look like? Does, does it look like a 90 minutes? Does it look like 60 minutes? Does it does it look like 15 minutes that these players can come on and provide some type of spark off the bench? And then Ola Rain, they've got the, the longer rest, obviously, between these two teams. They've got the home field advantage. But I'm looking at their attack. I'm looking at their middle third, and I'm looking at all of these really good pieces for this team. But during these last stretch of weeks, we've been seeing either scoreless draws or narrow draw or narrow results from this team. And I and we if we do end up seeing a dub from Ola Rain, I want it to be a significant scoreline. I need to see <laughs> a multi-goal game. It doesn't have to be a lot. It can even be a 2-0, 2-1. I would love to see it, but I got to see it happen from this rain sign, especially if they're coming off a, a little bit of a rest. So I know that there were some early frustrations uh, for the rain side to kind of start off things in this 2022. Uh, but I would imagine that head coach Laura Harvey and this group have obviously regrouped a little bit. And maybe they're looking at this one on the calendar saying, this is the one where we're going to get it all back and snatch it back and go on a little bit of a run. So while I'm excited to see it, I'm still going to keep this one as a draw because I don't care what kind of turn a quick turnaround it is long, quick. I don't think you can ever count out a hatch, a Sanchez or a Rodman to make some magic happen on the pitch. So I think we're going to get a draw. And that's is, what I'm going with. All it takes is one that's moment, right. one mental lapse defensively. And, and those players hatch Rodman Sanchez, they can jump on it and they can, they can really capitalize on that. And that's all it takes is one distinct moment. All right. I love it. 
Yeah, let's move on. Let's move on and take a look at some picks and previews for the rest of the games. Teams that have games in hand. Let's take a look at North Carolina Courage versus San Diego Wave FC. This one, I don't know if I went super back and forth on this one too much, and I'm just going to go ahead and put it out there and give my pick first. Lisa, I'm I'm going to go with North Carolina Courage mm-hmm. this one. Even after the, the midweek result that they just had and the efforts that they just put, even with the struggles that they've had with players out on COVID protocol, I do believe they're going to perhaps get some of these players back because this game takes place on Sunday. I'm going with North Carolina Courage in this one. How about you? I agree with you. I'm going to go with North Carolina in this one too. It, of course, depends on availability, player personnel availability. Um, but if we have... Caitlin Rowland back and Casey Murphy still questionable. Who do you think gets the start between those two? Oh gosh, that's a great, great question. I think it just depends on, on how Murphy is feeling. Yeah. After right. that kind of first outing that she had midweek. I, I know that Caitlin Rowland is, is a player who's been in, in the courage system for, for some time. She's a player that they made a move for to get back mm-hmm. into their program. But Casey Murphy, since she has made her arrival to the Kurds, has been the starting goalkeeper yeah. for this team. She has been in multiple United States women's national team camps. She has uh, a lot of clout around her right now, quite frankly. And just putting it quite simply, she is a good goalkeeper. Oh, yeah. So I would imagine that if you have this type of caliber of goalkeeper, who is able to go, you would play them. But was this start issued out of necessity, out of player circumstance? You know, there's a little unclarity there. So if 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 Roland is able to go back and to net and Murphy is actually maybe only somewhere between a 60 to 80 percent, I think that maybe with the quick turnaround, you give this game to Roland. I agree. I agree entirely. It so much depends on Casey Murphy's availability and how she is feeling. Um, But I'm thinking that North Carolina is going to have a lot of their players back in this match that, that were out on COVID protocol. Um, I agree. I think North Carolina gets the upper hand over San Diego, San Diego, also a a quick turnaround from their midweek match that they just played against racing Louisville. And they were handed a loss in that match. Um, So both of these teams coming off of losses, but I still give the upper hand to North Carolina. So we're both going courage in this win. We're we're both going courage in this win. And that's not to take it away anything from San Diego, but I just, I just think that this run that they went on to start their regular season, was impressive and I'm still impressed by it. I shouldn't use the past tense. I mean, they, they leveled things mm-hmm. out a little bit in this, in this match that they just had against racing Louisville and uh, were maybe fell just short of potentially snatching a point away from that one. But the win streak was snapped. And sometimes that hits a little bit of a reset button, like I mentioned, but I don't know if that is going to happen in this game. Again, we're talking about expansion sides that are getting looks at more established NWSL clubs as the regular season goes on. And this is an opportunity for San Diego, uh, I'm sure, to take a look at and say, how can we sort of address the opportunity in front of us to go right. ahead and maybe shock some people? Maybe they look at a North Carolina side, North Carolina Kurt said that it has had a lot of success in their past and quite frankly, recently with their Challenge Cup win. And maybe they want to, you know, circle this one and say, this is a match that we want to have a strong performance in. But I think with the quick turnaround, I think with another opportunity on the road, I'm not too sure if they're going to have all of the pieces there because now San Diego is being presented with the challenges that a lot of other clubs are being presented right. with. Player rotation, uh, minute management, and stuff like that. So travel. We'll travel on top of that with the legs, right? And then we'll see how that plays out. So I'm giving the edge North Carolina, and uh, I like that we went to Courage for both of us here. We'll see how that plays out. A team, another team that we haven't seen in a little while, New Jersey, New York, Gotham FC going to face racing Louisville FC. Lisa, we haven't seen Gotham FC. They had their uh, home opener postponed against North Carolina Courage some a couple weeks or so ago due to the fact that there was the COVID protocol for both sides of the pitch here when they were going up against North Carolina Courage. They had four players out. I believe the Courage had about six or seven out. So the game was called. It said, hey, we're going to postpone it and reschedule it. So Gotham 
has uh, has not been able to see some NWSL action in quite some time, and they're going to be going up against a racing Louisville side that just got a victory over San Diego Wave FC. So when you're looking at these two teams, tell me who you're picking and why. So you have to look at Gotham and, and their regular season. Yes, they're they're coming off of a bye week technically with that postponement, and they started the regular season with a bang, three nil over at Orlando Pride, and then. The next week turned around and it was handed to them 4-0 against San Diego Wave. They lost that one. So pretty hot and cold from Gotham FC. Did this off week and the bye week with the postponement dealing with a bit of COVID protocol help them or hurt them? Because some teams, they need those games to stay consistent, to stay on top of it. Honestly, I don't think that's Gotham because throughout the Challenge Cup, they were consistently hot and cold. If that if that's an oxymoron, if you ever heard one, consistently hot and cold. But that's exactly what Gotham was. So I'm thinking that an off week has truly helped Gotham be able to work on some of the things that they need to work on, focus on them, go against consistent competition in training every day against their own teammates and, and uh, opponents in that sense. And now as they have to face on a team in Racing Louisville that is coming off of a midweek match and that Gotham is playing at home, they'll play at Red Bull Arena. I think Gotham could get a win out of this one. And that is not to say anything against Racing Louisville because if any team can go into Red Bull and, and beat a team like Gotham, it's going to be Racing Louisville with their set-piece opportunities, with their threats in the front, with Jess McDonald and, and the possession that they've been able to build out of the back. And Katie Lund in goal has done tremendous for Racing Louisville. I just think that Gotham being – a team that's coming off of a lot of training, no game last week. They have the upper hand in, in this one, especially with fresh legs, no travel, and, and no midweek game against Racing Louisville. So I give it to New Jersey, New York, Gotham FC. I respect it. Listen, I hate to do it, Lisa, but I've got this one pegged as a draw too. Wow. It's too much back and forth for me to to, to go in it. Maybe that's a, a safe pick or, or not. I usually like to go bold and just pick a winner pick a loser but there's like you mentioned there's just been way too much inconsistency from gotham for me and racing louisville i think can sometimes be a little inconsistent in terms yeah. as well but i feel like i've seen a little bit more from this racing louisville side uh to sort of have enough to say that they might come out and look a certain type of way in this match they are gonna be on the road they are coming off of a quick turnaround but i'm not too sure if i'm looking at that as a negative for them and perhaps this is a game that might come down to something like set pieces. And if it does, that's a scary position to be in if you're the opposition going up against Racing Louisville because they show that they can absolutely capitalize on those moments. I'm also looking at perhaps maybe a more defensively organized shape from both of these teams here. Yes. We're seeing Louisville, in my opinion, kind of come off of a game where they can point to and say, we did some really good things here defensively. Let's try to make sure that we keep this going. When you're looking at a Gotham FC side uh, helped uh, and anchored by somebody like C uh, Caprice Didasco, you're looking, I think, at maybe two back lines that are kind of try to present some challenges for, for the attacks on, on both sides of the pitch here. And I think because of that, it might do a little bit of canceling out of mm -hmm. some things here, which is why I think we might get a draw. And I also think it might be a narrow draw i don't anticipate this one being a shootout at all but hey i would love to come on here and talk about how wrong i was last one lisa we've got orlando pride versus chicago red stars tell me who you're picking in this one and why i have chicago red stars in this match um i know that is music to your ears to hear that but Chicago traveling to Orlando, they're going to be playing at Exploria Stadium. Chicago, no midweek game for them. So they've had a bit of rest. Um, and also, I'm hoping to see the return of Mallory Pugh. She's been out now for a handful of games with concussion protocol. She has been training. Uh, but can we get her back in a game? Can we get some minutes for Pew? Um, how the midfield looks for Chicago, that's a little bit of a question mark as well. Morgan Gattral has been out with a bit of injury. Um, any updates from you on that, Sandra, before I'm... Not as of right pick? now. Okay. Yeah, not as of right now. Uh, when we spoke to Chris Petroselli ahead of that uh, previous game for the Red Stars, he mentioned that, that that was maybe a week too soon 
for right. a player like Mal Pugh. So maybe this this upcoming week isn't a week too soon for somebody like Mal Pugh. If she is available, I think that changes things for this Red Star side immediately. Um, on, quite frankly, even if she's unavailable for this one, I think maybe there's some unknowns here for uh, for the Orlando Pride that they might that might go against them a yeah. little bit. So we're looking at a Chicago Red Stars teams that. They're not too sure if they're going to face a Mel Pugh. And the, these two new pieces that they've got, well, one new piece and a returning piece for Chicago, they're going to eventually welcome in Chelsea Darber coming from the A League. And then we've got Sarah Luber making her return from loan after she had spent uh, nearly two years or about 18 months or so in uh, Liga MX Femenil with Club America. And uh, we're seeing the return of, of her for this uh, from from loan for the Chicago Red Stars team. And I think for Orlando Pride, if you're looking at things, there's not a lot of footage or film to go off of. If you're looking at these two new attacking pieces that are about to be reintegrated for this Chicago Red Stars team on the other side of that. These are two new players who haven't played with this 2022 side. How is that going to look for Chicago? Are the is is there has there been enough time in training? Has there been enough you know opportunities for for these players to kind of get reintroduced to things and get a little bit familiar uh, with the Chicago Red Star side and how they're trying to play? So that is an argument that can maybe go against them as well. We're not too sure if we're actually going to see them uh, within this match. We'll see, but we do know one thing: Orlando Pride's got Sydney Larue, and we know that she can make things happen. She definitely can. And and what we've seen from Orlando is that they've got a great high press. That's clearly something that they've worked on, that they talk a lot about, and that they focus on. That's how they've gotten goals. That's how they've gotten quick goals early in the game because it's it's a high press forcing teams to try to build out of the back or if they go long, looking to win it immediately in the midfield. And I'm expecting to see that again. Uh, we saw minute management between players like Leah Pruitt, Jan's daughter, yeah. Darian Jenkins in this midweek action. So will they get the start again this week alongside LaRue and players like that? I'm not sure. I'm thinking that we will, though. However, Chicago's a team that can build out of the back. That's something that Chris Petroselli loves to do is is possess he talked so much about how coming from the collegiate game in southern methodist university it was so hot that his team couldn't run they couldn't just chase and transition they had to possess the ball and let the ball do so much of the work and that's what he wanted to bring to this chicago team and now is the chance that Chicago will be tested. Can they build out of the back consistently? Can they break down a high press with a lot of quick, smart defenders on that counter press in LaRue, Jenkins, Leah Pruitt, that becomes a great outlet for the pride. And that's really the, the test. And that's those are the moments that I'm going to be watching at the high press and how Chicago can break it down. I think Chicago can do it, though. I, I honestly think that they can break it down in a variety of ways, switching the point of attack, breaking that first line of defense with a great through ball, and then turning and going with the power they have up top, whether it's Ava Cook, hopefully Mallory Pugh is back. Um, we'll see kind of how that unrolls. Ella Stevens as well, a huge threat for them. We'll see. We're both going to Chicago on this one. We'll see how it plays out Saturday and Sunday. Make sure you tune in to NWSL action, but shout out to UEFA women's champions league. The final will also be taking place on Saturday at 1 PM. You could check out all the action on the zone YouTube Barcelona versus Leon. Make sure you let us know who you got in this one and make sure you tune in. I'm sure it's going to be a thrilling match and we'll take some time to chat about it when it all takes place. Thank you all so much for joining us live. Thank you all for listening to Attacking Third. As always, follow us on Twitter, TikTok, and Instagram now at Attacking Third. We're on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, anywhere you listen to your podcast shows. We're also available as, as videos. Subscribe to us at youtube.com slash Attacking Third. And if you have questions for us, you can leave us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts with your question, and we'll answer it. And we'll be back more with more on Sunday with another live recap. For Sandra Herrera and Lisa Roman, this was Attacking Third.